Hi guys, it's Debbie and today I'm here to speak about something I had never planned on covering on my channel but I realised I find myself in a peculiar position situation so I thought I'd share my thoughts on the British royal family in the wake of the death of Queen Elizabeth. Most of the people who have been following my channel for quite some time know about my background but I'll give a quick recap for those who don't. So my mum is British from just outside London and my dad is Italian from an island called Sardinia. My dad has lived his entire life in Italy and my mum lived well into her adulthood in England. They met when my mum came over to Italy for what was supposed to be just a short work experience but uh, they ended up meeting, falling in love and they decided to spend the rest of their lives here in Italy. They had me and my brothers, um, they actually went back to the UK to give birth to us and we have basically been raised as exactly half British and half Italian. At home we spoke and still speak English with my mum and siblings and Italian with my dad uh, or if Italian guests come over. We eat both British and Italian foods to the point of reaching some interesting uh, fusion cuisines such as shepherd's pie with Sardinian pistocco bread or baked beans with grated Sardinian pecorino. Nice. These are just the examples but uh, to explain that although we've grown up in Italy watching Italian TV, going to Italian schools, playing with our Italian friends, they made sure we would also grow up as British kids. So we were educated on British culture, we had the British newspapers arrive here one day later uh, than England, we had all sorts of satellite things installed on the TV to get the British channels, we had cupboards full of VHSs with British films on them, um, we had a full selection of British British books that we would bring from England. Now if you're British this might seem totally normal for you but it obviously wasn't to have like the famous fives and secret sevens and the Paddington books and Roald Dahls and all of that in Italy pre-internet where, where now you can just get anything. Through all of this as well as regular lengthy trips back to England in which we would pack in as many activities and sites in as possible I was fortunate enough to experience two different cultures at the same time and so I can now see uh, certain aspects of British culture both as an insider and an outsider. So enter the royals. The concept of the British royal family seems easy to explain what they do, who they are. What is a little harder to explain is how they have become an identifying part of British culture, something which is unheard of for example here in Italy. Here in Italy we do of course have uh, many loved celebrities and we do even have a sort of royal family or to better say the people who would be the royals if Italy hadn't opted out of the monarchy. They've lived basically in exile most of their lives and they only really turn up for talk shows. Prima ti ho visto uscire dalla toilette. Sì. Ecco. Hai usato il bidet? Dopo or no? This is to say that there isn't really somebody here people uh, would close the whole country down for and mourn for as if they knew them personally. Somebody like the Queen. Over the channel instead the members of the British royal family are considered beyond celebrities. Whatever you do in the UK you will constantly be reminded of their presence. You will go grocery shopping and on your food there is the royal crest. You watch a football match and the national anthem is about God save the Queen or now King. You send a package there's the Queen's face on the stamp which you will put in a letterbox with her initials on it after paying with money with her face on it maybe after showing your ID with her name on it. They're photographed and covered daily like the Kardashians could never dream of. They are nearly always on the news or in newspapers, people try to copy their fashion. We have films and some of the most popular series of all time about the royals. Millions of people come to visit the royal residences every year. Of course if you're a tourist you won't travel to the UK just to visit Buckingham Palace but it is common to include that side of Britain in a trip and even if you don't you will still be bombarded with imagery of the royal family and probably you will bring home some sort of rel related nickname. Knack. Figures of speech often revolve around the royals, with the Queen being the uh, major icon as at 96 years old with 70 years of reign she has basically been there just throughout most of everybody's lives. Whether it was happy occasions, war times, covid times, famous mornings or famous celebrations she was always there. Think of Christmas which technically should be a religious holiday but 
not that many people maybe go to church, but trust me, a lot of people will tune in to watch the Queen's speech, which will now become the King's Christmas speech, which is <laughs> odd to imagine. There's just basically no way to avoid or ignore the presence of the royals. And I also feel like the success of the royal is also due to the fact that the Brits welcome their sort of posh royal attitude, whereas it might not have the same effect in other countries. As Brits tend to strive for that keep calm and carry on attitude, I myself feel like I often pride myself in not showing too many emotions or always keeping a sort of straight face in any type of adversity of, of being unwilling to bow down. Of course the modern reality is that we're just ostriches hiding our head in the sand and the poshest thing we come up with is forming a queue outside of Aldi. But the royal family with that stiff lip attitude is taken often as a role model, something a lot of people aspire to be like. And even if the UK is one of the most diverse countries in regards to cultural backgrounds, the royals are something which have united the population, everybody seems to be passionate about them, or at least have a strong opinion on them. Whereas in Italy, for example, you wouldn't have that for a politician or a celebrity. Maybe you'd have it for something different like food or football. Anyway, as with most famous things, there is a downside as this stoic attitude um, has been interpreted by some and appropriated by some as a sense of superiority on other people and other countries, probably due to the country's controversial past. As a matter of fact, while many people have this Disney-esque vision of the royal family, its history is very different. We're not going to delve into the full colony history because that would be a full university course, but put in very simple and down-to-earth words, in the past the Brits colonised many, many, many countries around the world. On the one hand, historians claim this dominion was with the good intention of helping these countries develop, to accelerate their economy, teach them English, as well as provide them with useful skills. But while these improvements mm, happened, it is also historically proven that the long-term impact of their control also had some disastrous results, depleting these countries of food and resources for decades, creating conflicts by meddling with borders and local politics, altering long-standard cultural traditions, in addition to downright murder and torture. Now, if we look in the history of any country that expanded its policies beyond its border, there often are atrocious crimes or at least, at the very least, an unwelcome presence. The problem and controversy of the British colonisation is that it is rather recent and uh, uh, the effects of it are still visible today. We still have people today who survived it and are asking for compensation and apologies and Queen Elizabeth was ruler during the, the, the end of it. Of course, it's not like she was guilty of massacres that happened 200 years before her reign or was directly at uh, order in murders. She just was suddenly on the throne of a country who'd been doing it for centuries. So I don't agree with those who say that she was absolutely guilty of everything and hated the colonized countries and was an awful racist. Most of it basically just turned up in her hands. So what I'm saying, it is great to look up at the good morals they installed, the role model they they try to pass on, the goodness they try to, to pass on to the world, but also knowing what led that person to be on the throne, who used to own the jewels that person is wearing, on what that power was based, what you're actually looking at when you visit the British Museum. King Charles or William and Kate and all the new royalty, of course, are basically nothing more than celebrities right now. Luckily, the world is completely different from how it used to be back in the day. Now it's all about Prince George's dressing gown selling out after the photos with Obama, or Meghan Markle's new podcast, or what Kate eats to stay fit. It's not wartime anymore. You're tweeting about King Charles from a Starbucks. And I think Diana was one of the first people to bridge over that shift. She joined one of the most traditional and old fashioned families in the world and brought in her very modern lifestyle, which of course clashed and probably was the tipping point during which people started to realize that it's not all a Disney fairy tale. The royal family has always presented itself as the role family, what people should strive to be. And although they have often tried to present themselves as vulnerable and down to earth and also flawed, it was still always in a very polished and orchestrated manner. And suddenly, 
with Diana there were discussions of eating disorders, mental health issues, cheating scandals, depression, things that are common, too common and maybe best to be avoided in the public eye. So again, as an insider and outsider, I think it's great to feel that feeling of unity as a country all together, regardless of all the different cultural backgrounds and all our differences in general, and look up to some good role models, but always questioning it and always making up your own mind. Amongst the younger generations, the affection towards the royals has been pulled to be lower and lower over the years, especially as their customs become more outdated. But the movements are against them still seem to be related to removing them from official matters. There is still a never dying buzz about them as a topic of gossip, just not in a position of power, which I find interesting. So everybody agrees that it's great to love the unity that the royal family preaches, the willingness to do good and be a good role model and strive for dialogue with other countries and people, all great things, but not ignoring the fact that they are like us, they are still humans. And more importantly, not forgetting the past and just moving on to Kate's new nail polish. Many countries and individuals have been asking for apologies which they never received. I think one of the first proper formal apologies for Kenya was less than 10 years ago, and for some of the massacres in India it's still all about speeches skipping around the word sorry. I think a lot of people don't realise that the royals are never going to sit down and make a YouTuber style apology uh, for everything that's happened in their past. Even Prince Andrew's ties with Jeffrey Epstein were treated in what was probably one of the most polished disaster management situations of all time, but there doesn't seem to be a collective effort to educate the country on, on, on its past. Making an effort to amend mistakes doesn't mean just drawing up a list of all the war crimes and and breaches of human rights that have happened in, in, in the past 250 years and say, okay, right, who do we apologise for today? Okay, we apologise for this and this and this. Okay, done, all good. It means educating people so that they can appreciate their country and appreciate the goodness that the royals may bring and the interesting uh, things that they might uh, teach. But realising it's all oh, not, let's just wave a flag and it's a bank holiday now. I know a lot of countries tend to ignore their past <laughs> United States. <coughs> but we also have some good examples. Germany, which is the country where some of the most evil plans in human history um, were planned, is making a huge effort to uh, amend its past, or at least apologise for its past. Maybe they don't go up to the microphone every day saying, oh, sorry Hungary, and oh, sorry Poland, and sorry Slovakia, but they make it compulsory in every school to learn about the horrors of their past. Kids are taken on school trips to concentration camps. Nearly all museums which cover those topics are free and highly educational. They used to have Holocaust survivors brought into schools and talk about their experiences. Imagine if that happened in the UK. You would see a lot of museums in a very different light. But these topics seem highly sensitive um, in the United Kingdom. Even myself, with what I think is a very balanced and a bit neutral video, I still wondered whether I should actually make it, because in the UK it seems that you can't really talk about the subject without getting into heated discussions. Because something else I noticed, as a somewhat outsider of the whole situation, is that people take the royal question very seriously, whatever side they're on. Many people will devoutly defend the royals, and I'm sure some British people would literally even be willing to die for them. While on the other hand, we have many who absolutely despise them. It's, it's rare to find somebody who would just shrug and say, they don't care about the whole situation. I used to be a teenager who didn't care at all about the royals, probably because growing up in Italy they didn't really do anything for me. I mean, if they had been or not been in the UK, my whole life would have been exactly the same. But as the years passed, I didn't develop a passion for them as in becoming a fan of theirs, but rather fascination into this weird world of theirs, because it is weird. They're millionaires locked in these mansions with these absurd rules about everything, even the way you walk in front of another person, with some extremely old-fashioned habits in one of the most modern and multicultural countries in the world. To me that's fascinated. I'm fascinated in watching these people talking about the death of the Queen as if they felt her so close to their family and closing their businesses and feeling profoundly touched by the royals' lives, although they never met 
get them. And I share the same opinion on them that I have about the celebrities, actors, directors I talk about all day in my work and here on my channel. Of course it's not like Johnny Depp and Zendaya have the same responsibilities as King Charles now. They're people just like you and me but who have been blessed or cursed with fame and money. It's easy now to just pick on King Charles, an elderly man who has seen the death of both his parents in the matter of months and is suddenly thrust all of this power across many parts of the world with cameras on him 24 7 and it's easy to just make fun of him for losing his patience about uh, for a pen losing some ink that's not a constructive way of criticizing the royals or appreciating the royals and being a british person i know that whether or i want it or not the royal family will be part of my life. The other night, for the first time, our king gave a speech, which is something really odd to say out loud. And although it had literally nothing to do with my career, with my life, with my aspirations, my work, nothing, I still felt part of something. And I thought it'd be interesting to share all of these thoughts with you. I am also very curious to know what you think about all of this topic so make sure to leave a comment down below i hope you enjoyed this video even if it was very different from the usual content on my channel and i'll see you in the next one bye